It's a chilly evening, but you're a warm audience, I can tell. And thanks for coming. Um, <clears throat> this is just to impress you, actually. <laughs> I'm, I'm not by nature a lecturer. Um, and I used to resent being lectured to when I was at school or younger. And um, I'm, uh, so I'm a little apprehensive, um, especially when I see so many of you here. And, um, but uh, I, I, I think that there are amongst you many who are aspiring writers, or maybe you've written books, um, or plan to write them. <clears throat> Um, or, or, or are in the process of writing them. Uh, so if anything I can say would help you or encourage you on the way, um, I would be very happy to, to be that person. When, when I was a boy, I was, a, of course, a prolific reader, as I think uh, any, any writer would be. So, and um, amongst the the authors that um, I liked. There was one called A. E. Milne, M-I-L-N-E, and he wrote essays, he wrote short stories, he wrote um, plays, very successful plays, even a detective novel. Um, he, he really enjoyed writing every moment of his adult life. But oddly enough, he's only remembered for one one small children's story that he wrote hmm, about his son's teddy bear, Winnie the Pooh. And so to his chagrin, um, he's remembered for this teddy bear and not for all the, 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 the stories and other things that he'd written. But that's the irony of life and, the, and the irony of the writing life too. Sometimes you can put your heart and soul into something, um, but it may not be appreciated. And something else that you toss aside or feel isn't, isn't really anything special. It might just catch the reader's fancy and uh, become a classic. And um, much the same thing you could, I was thinking the other day of Lewis Carroll, who was a professor of mathematics and it, everyone said a very dull fellow. And he wrote books on mathematics. He loved writing about mathematics. Even other mathematicians didn't read his books. They didn't think they were very good. Um, and one day he just, to please a little girl he liked, he wrote a, a story called Alice in Wonderland. And it was about, took two years before he could be persuaded to publish it. And today, 150 years later, there we are with um, thousands of children and grown-ups uh, reading this classic. And if he was alive, he, he would just be wishing somebody had read his, one, at least one of his books on mathematics. <laughs> so, so there's life for you. Well, I, my writing life is sort of, I could divide it up into, into periods of loneliness and periods of solitude. And uh, loneliness, I guess, is, um, is something that, um, that you don't invite, that it's, it's um, imposed on you in a way, or it's due to circumstances, or, or, or the way you, f the, the place you find yourself in. And um, solitude is something that you look for. Um, and I think a lot of writers have had lonely childhoods, <clears throat> and uh, mine was for many years lonely, and it Perhaps it all started here in, um, in Delhi when I was about eight, nine years old. And I was living with my father in um, a, little, a little road called Atul Grove Lane. It's still there. I, uh, last year I went wandering that way and I found this lane and it, to my amazement it hadn't changed. It was exactly as it was 60 years ago, 70 years ago. And, um, the old bungalow was there where we lived, and the trees, and a small plot of land. And um, it took me back, of course, to the year when I was living there on my own with my father, who was in the Air Force. It was World War II then. So he would go off in the morning to, to Air Headquarters, which was at South Block. 
and I would be left to my own devices, day, hour after hour, day after day, week after week, except weekends when he always gave me his time and took me for long walks. And um, so I would often pass the time by filling up exercise books with um, lists, lists of films I'd seen, lists of books I'd read, lists of records I'd bought or, or things I like to eat. And um, so I think these, some of the early books of lists um, that were ever written. And of course, I did, never kept them and I don't have them now, but it sort of set me off uh, in a way on, on the habit of writing. And then as I grew a little older, I started keeping a diary and a journal and putting down um, my thoughts or observations, even recording dreams. I, I found dreams have always played a great part in my writing life. If nothing exciting is happening around you, you can always um, write about a dream you've had. In fact, some of my early stories are based on dreams. And then school days, yes, okay. So when I was sent up finally to boarding school in um, Simla, the loneliness went because, you know, you hundreds of boys, sooner or later you make friends. And um, I became quite popular because I had this um, ability to write funny verses or um, limericks about teachers and um, or things like, um, poor little Johnny, he's with us no more. For what he thought was H2O was really H2SO4. <laughs> so you can see my chemistry wasn't too bad either. <laughs> um, and of course, when I did come back and finish school and um, you know, writing wasn't very fashionable in those days. Nowadays, I meet, every now and then I meet a boy or a girl who says, sir, I want to be a writer. Oh, I am a writer. And um, the, I remember my mother saying, well, Ruskin, now, <clears throat> what do you want to do? What do you want to do with yourself? And um, I said, mom, I think I'm going to be a writer. And she said, don't be silly. Go and join the army. Hmm? No. <laughs> In those days, the army was actually the first choice of most um, boys who, as they came out of school. And um, of course, the army has produced some good writers too. Um, but I think I probably would have just been another Beetle Bailey. So anyway, I was shunted off to England. My mother thought I'd do better for myself there. Uh, but in my last year in um, in my last year in school, um, and the last year in Der in India at home, I'd made many friends, and I. My journal had continued. This habit of keeping a diary or a journal is something that's been with me most of my life, and it helps in my writing, as it would help in yours. So um, this journal, when I came to England and I was going through a very lonely period there, very homesick for India, longing to come back. So I, I turned the journal, actually, into a novel. I fictionalized it, and it uh, became The Room on the Roof. And well, I didn't get a publisher straight away. It took me a year or two to get one. And then, too, I had to write two or three drafts. Um, uh, I had an editor called Diana Attell, who was a very brilliant one, and who later on went on to write several books herself. And anyway, the, the, uh, the book finally got accepted, and I was given an advance of 50 pounds. That was the standard advance in those days, and I <clears throat> used it to um, I used it to come back to India. You could come back in 40 pounds then. You, you came by sea, of course. We didn't have a, a regular air service at all then. And if you did go by air, it took about a week. <laughs> so um, I came back, and I was determined that back in India, I would make a living freelancing, writing. And of course, this wasn't easy because we didn't have many publishers in those days. Just there were academic publishers, those who did school books and college books, but um, nobody was publishing fiction or general literature or um, other things you see in bookshops now. Um, so I bombarded newspapers and magazines. We had plenty of those, thank goodness. 
and um, there were also, uh, and I, the fees were usually varied from 30 to 50 rupees a story, but if I wrote 10 a month, <laughs> I'd make enough to live on. <clears throat> and um, so I did this for two or three years. And in the meantime, the room on the roof came out and um, some copies came to India. It was serialized here. And like any um, young author, you like, to, you like to see your book displayed or in a bookshop. And in those days, we didn't have book fairs, we didn't have literary festivals we, uh, or book launches. You know, none of the um, promotional work that goes on nowadays. So I would wander around bookshops and see if they had my book. And I remember going into a little shop near, I think, Shankar Market it was, and um, looked around. And then I spied my novel right tucked underneath a pile of bestsellers, you know, um, <laughs> bestsellers of that period. And so I looked around with the bookseller looking or not. I thought he wasn't. So I took it out from under the pile and put it on top. <laughs> <laughs> so people could see it, you know. But the bookseller had spotted me doing this. So he, he came across, he didn't know I was the author, but he came across the room, he picked up the book, looked at it and said, ye ne chalta. <laughs> this isn't selling. And put it back underneath the pile. So I was very angry. So to teach him a lesson, I bought the book. <laughs> Sometimes our authors are reduced to uh, buying their own books. <laughs> So my author's ego was, was crushed, uh, as it often is.